Is that include me, listen only? Uh, welcome, first time. Good to see faces instead of uh, hearing through the phone. Uh, Melissa, why don't we do a roll call? Okay. Miss Avila Farias? You probably Here. need to uh, uh, unmute yourself. Miss Avila Farias? Here. Ms. Avila Frias here. Ms. Gallagher? Here. Ms. Gallagher here. Ms. Gunn? Ms. Gunn, if you could unmute yourself. Okay, not hearing Ms. Gunn, I'm moving on to Mr. Gunning. Here. Mr. Gunning here. Mr. Hunter? Here. Mr. Hunter here. Ms. Johnson Hall? Here. Ms. Johnson Hall here. Treasurer Ma. Here. Treasurer Ma here. Director Velasquez. Director, I see his, please. I see his room. Okay. Uh, Director, please unmute your mic. Director Velasquez. Yes, I'm here. Director Velasquez here. Secretary Castro Ramirez. Present. Secretary Castro Romero is present. Mr. Prince? Mr. Prince just sent me a text that says he's here, but that for some okay. reason he's All right, Mr. Prince is having uh, technical difficulties. We'll work with him. And Mr. Prince has acknowledged he's here. Mr. Russell? Present. Mr. Russell, do you, can present. you unmute your mic? So, uh, Mr. Russell, one more time. <laughs> I am present. Uh, Thank I'm you, present. Mr. Russell. Mr. Russell, present. Ms. Sotelo? I'm here, but I can't see myself on the screen, so I don't know if anybody else can see. <sighs> we can't we see you. We can hear you, Ms. Sotelo. Ms. Sotelo here. Uh, Ms. Campbell? I am here. I'm uh, Kate Gordon again. Okay, Ms. Campbell here. Ms. Lai? Pardon me, Ms. Lee? Ms. Lee, can you unmute yourself and try again? Oh, there we go. Hello, I'm here, present. Ms. Lee, present. And Ms. Bowman Patterson? Here. Ms. Bowman Patterson, here. Uh, Chairman Gunning, we do have a quorum. Thank you. And I will acknowledge that this is our first effort at using GoToWebinar for this event. So uh, we apologize that there, we may have to just work through um, the new getting used to it issues. Thank you. Well, I'm, I'm just so glad not to be on a Zoom meeting or something <laughs> different than a Zoom meeting. So at least we get new software to try. Welcome to everyone. Uh, thanks for making it. Uh, has anyone had a chance? Everyone had a chance to look at the minutes from the May 14th uh, board meeting. Was there any changes or additions to that by anyone? Hearing none, Melissa, let's deem those approved. Uh, moving on to item number three: um, comments. Uh, just brief comments. We just learned that the assembly and senate are not coming back until the 27th. They were initially supposed to come back on the 13th. And then I think all of you know that we now know Tom Lackey was hospitalized last week and Autumn Burke uh, announced that she had COVID. Uh, rumors are at least three to four other members have it as well. So it just, it goes to the times, right? It's just, who knows? It's crazy. But I think in an effort to minimize exposure, the assembly now is delayed another couple weeks. But I just share that so that everyone appreciates um, um, unique times. And I think it just makes our, our jobs here that much more important um, given the circumstances. So with that, Tia, I'll close out. I know you have some uh, things to cover here. The floor is yours.
Are you on mute, Tia? Yep. Um, Mark? I love, I love technology. <laughs> <laughs> We can see her, we just can't. Oh, we can see her, I know, we know she's there. Mark? <laughs> hey, Lourdes, I just want to make sure you have your UCLA glass with you. Yes, fight on. <laughs> Mark? Melissa? I actually need some brewing gear. I don't have anything, Preston, so <laughs> I'll have to make my way to the brewing store someday. I'll send you some. I have I I I have a pipeline. Okay. <laughs> Get the hook up. <laughs> okay, Tia, your turn. We're, we're having technical difficulty. Can you hear me? <laughs> yeah, no. We can hear you now. Oh, they can hear you now. Okay, so I'm just gonna talk really loud. Does that work? <laughs> And what's different than before? <laughs> so, those of us working in housing know that government policies from redlining to restrictive zoning have created enormous disparities for Black Americans in terms of wealth and opportunity. The team here at College of Faye remains committed to doing what we can to address this injustice. It's been just about six weeks since the death of George Floyd. And it was a very powerful reminder of the systematic racism that we face here in America. Cali Chefe will be participating in the 2021 Capital Collaborative on Race Equity Learning, which is a cohort of California state government teams working together to advance racial equity. Over 15 months, the participants received training to learn about, plan for, implement activities that embed racial equity approaches into institutional cultural policies and practices. Now more than ever, I believe this effort is vital for our agency and for our mission of making more Californians, making sure more Californians have a place to call home. I'm pleased to say that California is leading the way and being a state government to form multi-agency programs of this, uh, of this scale. And I'm extremely proud of Cali Chefe will be undertaking this important work. This effort is completely aligned with our 2021 business plan that you approved in May. Back in 2010, Cali Chefe was tasked with administering the federal hardest hits funds through Keep Your Home California. That program wound down mid 2018 and we have officially closed it out. Tim will be sharing his report, um, and I believe there may be some postings that we post later in case you can't get through all of those details. I, the final numbers were about 2.2 billion allocated to help more than 79,000 families stay in their home. Uh, the national mortgage settlement was a uh, happened during the down cycle of the economic instability is upon us once again. And in the governor's 2021 budget, Cali Chefe was allocated 300 million from the National Mortgage Settlement Fund for the purposes of providing housing counseling services by HUD certified counselors to homeowners, former homeowners or renters and provide mortgage assistance to qualified households. We will be working very diligently to implement that program and we hope to bring you back phase one of that program in August so that the we can start getting those funds out very quickly. So we will be calling you in for August so that we can get that program up and running very quickly. I think that is scheduled tentatively for August 13th. In that meeting, we will brief the board and we will select the intermediaries and request approval for phase one of the mortgage settlement funds. As I mentioned in the past, there's a significant relief to stable the housing space during the time of uncertainty, and some of th these needs come from the federal government. They are the ones that are have the fiscal capacity to step in. CalHFA has been in close federal discussions on COVID stimulus this far, and will be closely following the, incoming the, the upcoming discussions between the Senate and the House in phase four. 
There have been some positive developments with robust housing provisions, including the HEROES Act and moving forward the infrastructure bill and grateful to the regulatory relief provided by the IRS to help us with our tax credit allocation program. Mr. Uh, Francis Marti has been extremely instrumental in making sure that we track all of this. He has a wonderful presentation prepared for you, but in the interest of time, uh, Mike, we, 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 we've elevated him to Director of Legislation and Policy because he is intricately involved in the policy making on both the federal and the state side. Also, since we last met, the governor and the legislature passed and signed the 2021 state budget and the new budget certainty reflects our current economic reality. But some resources for affordable houses remain, including the 500 million in state tax credits and some of the low and moderate income funds for CalHFA. Um, as you all know, uh, Judith um, Blackwell is here and she will be doing a joint presentation with um, Mr. Marti after he uh, provides a brief review of policy and legislation. And she will be updating us on the status of the adoption of the regulations changes that are necessary to help implement the state low income housing tax credits for the 2021 year. Lastly, last year, the governor challenged high tech companies to contribute resources toward elevating the housing crisis in California Last November, Apple announced a multi-billion dollar investment across several initiatives to address the affordable housing challenges in California. Later that month at our November board meeting, I mentioned that CalHFA does have a role and part of the Apple announcement. And you will also remember the board workshop on bond recycling that we held in December. Our director of finance, Tim Su and Frances Marti, have taken some of the best practices from the city and state of New York. And CalHFA has just recently found a credit facility that allows us to create the first tax exempt bond volume cap recycling program in the state of California. CalHFA has entered into that credit facility with Rayburn Capital Inc., a subsidiary of Apple to launch this effort. That total loan commitment amount is 250 million. That is the total amount borrowed cannot exceed 250 million at any time in the next five years. The credit facility expires on June 18, 2025. Calhfa does not incur any financial costs related to the outstanding commitment, and there are no negative carry on amounts from the borrowing. This is a unique credit facility with very favorable financial terms for Calhfa in the state of California. We believe this recycling program will become a critical tool for the state of California to preserve and produce additional units in the next five years. And we're looking forward to our continued collaborative relationship with SIDLAC and TCAC. I'd like to remind the board that the staff's authority to enter in that credit facility was provided for in section 16 of board resolution 20-04. And with that, Chairman Gunny, I'll turn it over to you. Awesome. Uh, thank you, Tia. Any questions or comments from board members? This is Lourdes. I just wanted to um, add a comment. Um, first of all, you know, I wanted to acknowledge and recognize the leadership of Tia and, and uh, the Cal HFA uh, staff, um, specifically as it relates to um, what Tia mentioned, you know, the commitment to um, racial equity um, and economic equity. Um, there uh, has been an effort underway to develop uh, an equity tool, um, uh, basically focused on helping to um, improve our internal practices um, and also um, really a concrete tool uh, to ensure that as we're reviewing um, housing policy, um, housing related um, efforts uh, within um, agency that were um, incorporating an equity lens. And this is um, a, a tool that will be introduced uh, to the Government Alliance on Race and Equity. Uh, and it will be a tool that will be adopted um, by the various you know, um, housing departments 
um, including uh, Kelly Jaffe. And so just wanna, again, you know, thank her and her, her team for being part of the, the conversations um, that have led to the development of this tool. Thank you, Secretary Castro Ramirez. I, I can't tell you, it's just encouraging that we're on the forefront of that and through your leadership and Tia, certainly appreciate that because it's, it's important and it matters. Okay, moving along, I think item number four, I'm sorry, any other comments from board members before we move forward, move on? Good, well then let's go ahead, Kate, and, and, and tee up um, item number four, Frischman Hollow 2. So I think uh, Ruth and uh, Sheena, you're up. I saw you practicing, so I know you're ready. <laughs> Ruth is also in the boardroom, so just give her a second. Right here. Okay. Oh, good morning. Um, this morning I'm presenting Freshman Hollow, first off. And this is a project. Well, let me introduce myself first. I'm Ruth Bikili. I'm the loan officer for this project and the next one. Frischman Hollow is in Truckee, which is in Nevada County. It's a family project. And um, I'm going to go to the next slide. Okay. Maybe coming a little closer will help too. Okay, got it. So you can see a site aerial view of the property in Truckee. It's in central Truckee, not far from downtown. There are nearby a mix of apartments and single family homes. This is the um, site plan. And it shows that this is a second phase of a two phase project. Frischman Hollow phase two, phase one has already been developed in 20, uh, 2005, I believe, by the same developer. And this is a subject site, but deeply forested and quite nice. And a view of the street, sorry. And here is a picture of phase one, which is an example of what, the, what phase two will look like. Phase two will be a 68 unit project in four buildings. There will be 12 studios, 12 one bedrooms, 24 two bedrooms and 23s. There's also a community building that was already built in phase one and both phases will have access to. It has a computer center, meeting space, and a kitchen. There will also be laundry facilities, picnic areas, playgrounds, and on-site parking. There will be um, you know, general unit amenities and all units will have washer, dryer hookups. The project is 100% affordable with rents ranging at 50%, 60%, 70%, and 80% of AMI. The rents are between 48 to 90% of market rents for the Truckee area. So they will be affordable to all ranges. This is in a TCAC high opportunity area and um, actually mapped as the highest resource. The construction will be modular and uh, as with phase one, which was also modular, the uh, units will be built by Nashua Builders, the same company that built phase one. And the developer and general contractor have considerable experience with this modular product. The um, use of the modular construction will speed up the construction schedule, which is a, a pretty big factor in the Truckee climate. The units need to be um, delivered to the site and um, substantially built before the weather hits. And currently grading is underway and the units are in production. Delivery is scheduled uh, within the next month or so and they will be um, stored in nearby Truckee and then delivered to the site on an as needed basis. There's a very high demand for this type of housing in the market and the project is anticipated to reach stabilized occupancy within four months of completion. Banner Bank is providing the construction loan of 22,745. 
The town of Truckee is providing a land loan of 1.36 million. Cali Tefe is providing the permanent loan of 6,610,000. The term is for 17 years and the loan is amortized over 40 years. We're also providing a MIP loan of 4,388,000, which matures along with the first, and tax credit equity totals 14,750. The Martis Valley, uh, Martis Valley is a um, workforce housing source of funding, and they're providing a million dollars at perm closing. The developer is also de uh, deferring 1.7 in fee, and that will be paid over time out of net cash flow. We're requesting a couple of variations from our term sheet. Uh, one is that the MIP loan amount exceeds the limitation of no more than 50% of the permanent loan, and it exceeds a limitation of 50,000 per unit. Both are recommended in order to reduce the state tax credit equity request and uh, resulting in a more efficient use of sources. The borrower is Alder Pacific, which and the developer is Pacific West Communities. The general contractor is Pacific West Builders. We have a very uh, good track record with this developer and builder. And um, the next project that I'm going to present is also the same developer. So um, with that, I will take any questions from the members of the board. Any questions? Just make sure you identify yourself before you talk. Um, Mr. Chair, this is Delilah Sotelo. Um, can, can we please have Ruth just elaborate a little bit more about the justification of the waiver? Um, just um, explain um, the justification. Did you hear that, Ruth? Yes, I did. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Um, what we have done is, this is these are two standard variations, and increasing the MIP loan amount to uh, 50,000, exceed 50,000 is recommended in order to reduce the state tax credit equity. And um, that's something that we have done on several projects. Um, the MIP loan is increased as a way to bring about more efficient financing and to close a gap that could exist if there were insufficient tax credits. Is that because of the pricing of the tax credits or is it because of the, uh, we're trying to allocate the state tax credits to more projects? It would be the latter. Okay. Ms. Patello? Because yes. the tax credits are a very precious resource and they are equity as opposed to debt, we try to make sure that we use that we are very efficient in how we allocate those tax credits. And since the mixed income program subordinate debt is debt that is going to be repaid, that's that that is the reason for, uh, the justification because we want to ensure that that equity that's provided for and uh, 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 in the state tax credit is used more efficiently. Okay. I just thought we were seeing a, a drop in pricing for equity. So I just wanted to flush that out. But okay, thank you. Mr. Chairman, this is um, Lourdes. I, I have a question on of Ruth, um, just um, if, if you can walk us through Ruth on page nine and then page 10, I want to you know better understand the affordability and occupancy restrictions. As I read through them, um, th there seem to be some inconsistencies and I just want to make sure that I understand the total number of uh, units um, restricted at the various a AMIs um, and um, and so there's, you know, like uh, section 12, um, the narrative seems to imply one thing. And then the rent limit summary table um, provides the breakdown. But then if, uh, when I look at the next section, the number of units and AMI rents restricted um, don't seem to 
align. And so I want to make sure that I understand like um, how to interpret this. And then just really at the end of the day, you know, understanding the number of units and the affordability restrictions. The bond regulatory agreement is restricting 40% uh, of the units at 60% or below. Oh, sorry. Can you hear me? So the bond regulatory agreement has one set of restrictions at 40% of the units at 60% AMI or below. And the mixed income program has separate restrictions with 10% of the units at 50%, 10%, at 60 to 80, the balances of the units are restricted at 120% or below. So the table on the following section shows just, it, it's not necessarily intended to show a total as it is intended to show the number of units at each AMI level. Mm. Did I answer your question for so, you? Ruth, what's the it's 100% affordable. Yes. With what percentage at uh, uh, above 80? How about you go there? That's a good way of putting it. The percentage above 80, say 81 to 120, yes. is 80% um, of the units. What percent of the units? So if we have 10% at 50, 10% at um, 80 and below, then there would be 80% at 81 to 120. And those 81 to 120, those units did not receive state tax credits. Correct. So the way the mixed income program works, if you are receiving units that are not tax credit eligible, you do not receive a state tax credit. And so, the 81 to 120, you said 80% of the development is in that moderate income? Yes. And can you explain the market rate and what the market uh, what the market study showed the, the, the need for those units and how much below the market we've restricted those units? Okay, can, um, I, can I interrupt? Um, I'm sorry, Tia. I just want to make sure that I'm understanding, following this well. So... Um, 80% of the 68 units that are going to be created are between 81% to 120. So we're, if, if, so that means only 20% of the 68 units will be affordable, like uh, under 80%. Is that what, is that what you're saying? I don't think Ruth has gotten her percentages correct. You don't think so? No, because if you have 48% of the units at 50, you can't have 80% of the units at 80 to 120. So I don't think your percentages are right. So, Tia, I'm, this is, I'm eyeballing it, I have to admit. So, so Tia, this is Kate. And I think um, what's confusing is that there are several regulatory agreements that restrict the same units at different levels. And well, that's, the, so that's what you're seeing here. If you go to the top, actual restricted units, no matter who's regulating it, the actual restricted units. Ruth? All of the units are actually restricted. I understand that, but what's the lowest restriction on those units? The lowest restriction is at 50% AMI. The tax credits restrict 33 of the units at that level, and that would be the maximum number of units at 50%. So here, Madam Secretary, about 70% of the units are 70% AMI and below. About 20% of the units are between 80 and 120. So Ruth had it just the opposite. Pardon me, yes 80 I did. 80% of the units are below 80, 20% of the development is between 80 and 120. So, so if we were to look at the rent limit um, table that says that at 50%, we're going to produce 33 units 
um, and then by you know it shows by studio one bedroom two bedroom is that is that the table that we is that I guess the the table that dictates the affordability for this project because I understand like there's you know different sort of requirements but I'd like to know like um, how many units of um, how many affordable units are we producing for families making 50% of AMI, for families that are making 60% of AMI, for families that are making 70% of AMI? And so if, if that's the rent limit summary table, I just want to understand like, you know, yeah. what we're yeah. approving here and what we're producing here. And you look at the very top where it says rent limit summary table, that yeah, gives you a breakdown of the affordability. Yes. Right. 33 of the 68 units are restricted at 50% AMI. Okay. 14 at 50, 7 at 70, 13 at 80. Okay. So then so uh, all of the units with the exception of one manager unit are below or 80% or below. Got it. Got it. Well, and so the next table, Kate. Yeah, so just the next table, um, if, if you scroll down, um, where it says 53, oh, I'm sorry, go up a little bit, where it says 53 units at or above 120, what, um, what does that mean? Um, Madam Secretary, it's kind of meaningless. And um, we need to do a better job of how we present this information because mm -hmm. what has happened is you have regulatory agreements on top of regulatory agreements. And I've mentioned that this is somewhat confusing when we present it. When we present it, we need to present it to you as to what is the 55 year long term affordability. And as Kate is saying, it looks like 100% is below 80% AMI, which means that the entire project is um, affordable to low income residents. Yes, and it is it is confusing because we have that less than or equal to 120, but they're still 80, 80 and below. So um, what we're trying to show there is there are so many layers of bond regulatory agreements. It's important especially from a documentation perspective that we include that. So the top box, the rent limit summary, is I think what you are interested in, Madam Secretary. Thank you, that, that really helps um, better understand, you know, the affordability breakdown. Yes. Um, and yeah, and maybe moving forward to, to your point, it would be helpful just to, to know, you know, uh, what number should we be looking at, uh, recognizing that there are different regulatory requirements, you know, depending on the funding source? Yes, ma'am. Good. Any and other questions? To, yes, Mr. Ahead. Chair. Just to just to add to that, I, I think this conveys that, and, and let me just understand it. Um, this table indicates that of the 68 units, no units are are being rented between 80% and 120% AMI. So someone who's at 120% That's right. can, op can occupy these units, but they will be paying rent at 50, 60, or 80. Correct. Okay, so from a, from a policy standpoint, uh, just looking at the MIT and the usage of the MIT, it is not, uh, well, it it seems to, to say that um, even though the MIP regulatory agreement says that 53 of the units are targeting individuals at 120% AMI, that in fact is is uh, they're not targeting at that level. It's they're targeting it act, much lower. Yeah, it actually says that they have to be less than or equal to 120. So so you're correct. That's why we show both tables because. The regulatory agreements are broader than the actual income uh, rent limit restrictions. So, so the gap that's really created in the program or in the project is as a result of the deeper targeting of those units. Because if they were renting to someone who was at 120% AMI and could afford to pay a rent at 120% AMI, 
you would be able to generate a little bit more income for the property. You would, depending on where a property would be, because of course, 120% of AMI may be above market in some prop in some areas. So it depends on the market you're operating in. But yes, that's true, um, sort of globally. But it really um, is down to the local market area that you're operating in. Okay, so I think that just from a from a future policy discussion standpoint, we should really look at the utilization of the MIP program to really effectively enable, um, you know, the targeting of families between 80% and 120% AMI, uh, rather than facilitating or filling the gap of, of projects where there's deeper targeting. Yeah, and in Truckee specifically, I and I have to go back and reread the entirety of this, but I believe 80 to 120 percent AMI would be um, at market or above market, which is which is why I say you know different markets you can do that, and we certainly try to achieve that, and it's generally in larger markets like you know metropolitan areas, but for a market like Truckee, um, I believe their market rents are actually um, less than 80 to 120 percent of AMI. So so that's one of the metrics that we always look at when we're analyzing the market. I just want to add that, right. also, applies, that also applies to the Valley where our market rents are at 60 percent of AMI. So just right. So, right. 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 So, so, this so that perhaps the M MIP program would not necessarily uh, be maximized in those areas. Yeah, but well, it's also it, not, it's not right for, hold on, I'm sorry, it's not right for the Valley to be cut out of all of the state tax credits that are being set aside for the middle income program. Um, and so the adjustments that the board made to this program was to make it so places like Fresno and Truckee could still access the state tax credits that are coming to College FA. So uh, I just want to point out that this was a policy thing I thought we talked a lot about. Yeah, well, and, and this is Tina. I would also take exception to that as I represent San Bernardino and Riverside County, where we would be uh, negatively impacted if we were to to uh, go the route that uh, uh, Mr. Tello is suggesting we go. So um, we no, just no. I'm just to that. clarify. I'm not suggesting that we go that way, uh, Mr. Okay. Tello. I'm, I'm I'm saying that from a policy discussion. You know, now that we have have had three rounds of of this program or you know are in our third round of this program it would be good to analyze that and to see the the impact of what you know the policy discussion of that well and and i think that's a very um fair thing i will tell you that our program is serving units from um 30 percent ami to um I think 110 is the highest and our average is around 60. So that it's very um, locationally driven in terms of what the AMIs are. And to um, Mr. Prince's and Ms. Johnson Hall's comments, it's very driven by local markets. And we're very careful to make sure that we're analyzing because mixed income in Fresno means something very different than mixed income in Los Angeles. So um, it's they're going to be different AMI levels. And and if I could just remind the board when Doug Shoemaker was here and presented on the workshop, he mentioned how the AMIs in various jurisdictions had gone up. And although when initially we started talking about the mixed income and, and targeting 80 to 120 and certain high cost areas. Those, men, those median incomes have gone back up. And so the program requires us to do a rental market study. And that whatever we are using our subsidy dollars for, it's to make sure that it is for affordability and bringing down lower than what the market study is showing. And so we aren't getting a whole lot of 80 to 120 unit tranches because the market isn't supporting that at, and we are going for affordability below market. Right. And our, and our program specifically requires that the units be, the unit rents, regardless of the AMI level, be at least 10% below market. So in some markets that completely 
disallows anything over 60% AMI. It just, it, it's very market specific, which is good because we have the opportunity to be flexible depending on the needs of the individual markets. And then if I can add into what uh, our secretary was saying, which I, I totally appreciate the deep targeting kind of look. Um, I mean, I, I, again, in the Valley, I feel like the uh, modern income and upper income households are, are the rhino goals are being met, uh, but very low and extremely low, extremely low are not being met. And so I, I know that we have a housing crisis throughout all income levels. And I know we've talked about the, the middle income program as being really important. I totally get it, but um, it, it just still feels like uh, very low and extremely low income families are at the greatest need. And I think COVID has really pointed that out even more. And if I can speak to that, Mr. Prince, College of Faith Mixed Income Program is not its only lending program. We probably have three projects in the Fresno and Central Valley areas in which the AMIs are 50% AMI and below. So we do understand the geographic needs and meeting those unmet needs, but it's also important to be able to have a broad spectrum so that you can meet the various income levels depending on what the market is showing. And so we are using other sources to be able to get at those needs in the Central Valley. Specifically, we have jointly funded projects with affordable housing, sustainable community in conjunction with some developments that are going on in Fresno which are deeply targeted and affordable. And so we do understand that we're meeting all of those needs by having a buyer, having lending products that can be used most efficiently. Uh, can I change the topic just a little bit, which is, I thought there was a great article about um, the permanent supportive housing in San Francisco being modular construction, saving dollars. I totally appreciate that this is modular construction. Um, we know that for every million dollars of construction in a community, it creates 17 jobs. That's what we found in Fresno. Um, we do modular construction and, and half of the construction is done in Idaho, um, that that takes out you know eight and a half jobs out of Fresno. And so I, I totally get the uh, importance of, uh, of methodology that provides affordable housing at volume, um, but I also think about those economic impacts. And so my question would be, um, uh, as we continue to look at alternative um, methodologies and ideas, is there a way that there's a I don't know, analysis about what's the right, the, the, the best and practices so communities like fresno i mean I, we're looking really hard at modular but as i said i'm balancing it through uh, with this idea of job creation i would love to have um you know more policy conversation around that uh, as a funders i don't know the right way or if it's with uh gustavo and secretary castro ramirez uh you know at that level i just i don't know what the answer is or what my question is other than i think it's a really interesting topic that has been raised today um, I see, Mr. Russell, you have your hand up. I want to remind everyone, though, make sure you say your name and before you, you talk, because not everyone gets to see what you look like. Some folks are just listening in. <laughs> Go ahead, Stephen. Great. Thank you. Yes, Stephen Russell. Um, so I, I just want to, uh, to, to, to follow up on, on Mr. Prince's comment uh, about the modular, because I, we, I agree that we need to be looking at this technology. We do need to look at how we can stimulate production. I would hope that any relief that packages in the years ahead, because we're looking at a multi-year uh, you know, recovery uh, in the state here, could include uh, incentivizing the creation of, of a localized uh, modular production. Uh, with local workforce, but I and I don't want to rest. This this is getting a little bit of field of the exact question in front of us, but I think it raises a policy question that I would hope that we would look at uh, moving forward. Awesome, thank you, Stephen T. You got all that? Yes, sir. If you want to open it up to public comment, that was the next move. Um, any members of the public want to comment on the discussion regarding Frischman Hollow Two? Mr. Chairman, members of the public should raise their hand if they're interested in asking a question or commenting. How do we see that on here? 
your organizer will see it and will call um, the person for the question, and that is Courtney. Courtney's handling that for us today. Thank you, Courtney. Hi, um, Caleb, you have your hand up. Do you have a comment for the board? Yeah, thank you, um, members of the Cali Chiffre Board. Uh, this is Caleb Roop uh, with the Pacific Companies, and um, thank you for considering our projects today. Um, I just wanted to follow up a little bit on Preston's comment that um, about the job loss or lack of job creation. And, um, and I just wanted to kind of add that really the point of modular construction is to reduce the construction costs and thereby save dollars so that those same public dollars can be now deployed to another project. Uh, so I would think in terms of like how far can you spread your public dollars to generate jobs versus the cost of any one project and it and it let its job production itself because I think um, you know our point in using modular is it saves time and it saves money. We've done about 15 modular projects, um, and you know the Central Valley is not typically the place to do modular, although we've done modular a couple times there. Um, but nevertheless, we're we're focused on using modular in the urban core areas where it's just the costs have become enormous. And, and so now I think um, the key is to kind of look at modular as a way to make projects feasible and, and spread public dollars that are limited out to more projects and make more projects happen. That's kind of how we view it from a policy point of view. Thanks, Caleb. Courtney, is there anyone else? There is no one else with their hand up. You may proceed. Is there a motion? No other, no other comments from the public? No comments, sir. Great. All right. Is there a motion to adopt the resolution? I so move. This is Preston. I can second it. Uh, will... May I this second? I, I just want to second it. Okay, we've got three seconds. Okay, hang on one sec. There's been a motion and a second. Motion by Preston, second by Jonathan. But Mr. Russell, your your comment. Uh, I just would want to say that 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 uh, I agree that the cost savings is critical at this time. I think long term, however, we should look at ways that we can re realize the benefits of cost savings and the local production of of modular housing. It's a long term goal. Uh, and I think that what, what uh, Mr. Roop and his group is doing in terms of proof of concept is very important to what we're doing right now in housing production. In the long term, I would like to see factories in all of our regions of the state that are producing this kind of housing so that we can begin to, you know, again, it's about rebuilding our job base. It's about uh, bringing down costs. It's about achieving all of those policy goals at once. So I'll commend Mr. Roop for his innovations and thank him for his leadership that will lead our state, I hope, to having more such, such uh, projects uh, in the future. So I'm, I will be happy to support the motion. Is that the commercial for Caleb? <laughs> <laughs> I'm messing with you. All right, there's been a motion and a second. Um, I think Treasurer has a quick comment. Yes, go ahead, Treasurer Ma. Yeah, can I just add on to Stephen Russell? Um, I've been following Factory OS, as well as RAD, uh, some of these module companies and the demand is um, far surpassing the supply at this moment. But I agree with you, you know, if we can bring more operations and, and manufacturing back in-house to California, of course, I think that is the goal to try to make sure that we employ as many people as we can in California. So uh, I agree with you, but you know, this is a new type of uh, manufacturing construction type. And uh, I'm happy that you know, people are using it to try to figure out how we can build housing um, quicker uh, and also save as much public dollars as we can. So I agree with uh, Mr. Russell. Awesome. Thank you, Treasurer Ma. And speaking for the home builders who represent them, I agree. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, motion. Yes. Melissa, roll call, please. <laughs> Yes, before I start, I'd like to um, ask Ms. Gunn to uh, look at her audio issues. Um, otherwise, we will not be able to uh, hear her vote. And if we can't get it done before the end of the roll call, we'll take your vote at a later time. Um, so, this okay. is Ms. Gunn. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Thank you very much. All right, great. Um, we'll start with Ms. Avila Farias. Yes. Ms. Avila Farias, yes. Ms. Gallagher? Yes. 
Ms. Gallagher, yes. Ms. Gunn? Yes. Ms. Gunn, yes. Mr. Gunning? Yes. Mr. Gunning, yes. Mr. Hunter? Yes. Mr. Hunter, yes. Ms. Johnson Hall? Yes. Ms. Johnson Hall, yes. Treasurer Ma? Yes. Treasurer Ma, yes. Director Velasquez? Uh, Director Velasquez? Aye. Uh, I'm sorry, yes. Director Velasquez, aye. Secretary Castro Ramirez? Yes. Secretary Castro Ramirez, yes. Mr. Prince? Yes. Mr. Prince, yes. Mr. Russell? Aye. Mr. Russell, aye. Ms. Sotelo? Uh, I'll abstain. Ms. Sotelo abstains, and uh, uh, Karen, we have the resolution 20-20 is approved. Awesome. Thanks, Melissa. All right. Why don't we keep it going with Parkway Apartments. Ruth, are you leading this one too? Yes, I am. Okay, let me get teed up here. It is Parkway. Great, thank you. Okay, the Parkway Apartments is a project in Folsom, which is in Sacramento County. It's an affordable project. And let's see, make sure I'm. Which one is it, Parkway? Yeah, we got it. There. Okay, very good. Thank you. This is a site view, and the project is on Oak Avenue Parkway and Blue Ravine Road. It's adjacent to a large city park and a walking trail system that goes throughout the city of Folsom. This is a street view, and it is the project is near a um, market rate apartment project. It's in a neighborhood that is um, consisting of senior single family homes and apartments. Ruth, sorry yes. to interrupt. This is Kate. I'm gonna ask you to go to um, conditions. I know that all the board members have, have read this, but just in the interest of time, could you go to any um, conditions of approval and the unit mix and sort of the core pieces of the deal? Sure. Capital staff. Okay, thank you. Yeah, okay. Um, I just want to leave you with a beautiful rendering. <laughs> the project is, is quite attractive. Um, involved in the financing structure is California Bank and Trust providing a construction loan. Boston Capital is the equity provider. CalHFA is providing a permanent loan of $7.5 million, amortized over 40 years and due in 17 years. We're also providing a mixed income loan of 3,350,000, which matures along with the first mortgage. And there's tax credit equity of almost 13 million. The developer is deferring a million dollars in fee. And um, one of the exceptions we're requesting on this project is rather than a split of net cash flow to the developer 50%, and 50% to the subordinate lenders, we're requiring a 75% split of net cash flow to the developer to pay off the developer fee and 25% to the subordinate lenders. So this is um, a way of getting the deferred developer fee paid back in year 15, by year 15, after which our mixed income loan would be uh, received 50% of the residual receipts, and that would be on a pro rata share. One thing that, that I um, wanted to mention also is that the city of Folsom is providing a loan as well, and they will be sharing in the uh, subordinate lender split of the residual receipts. Uh, city of Folsom is $4.7 million, and the county is providing a fee waiver of over a little over $100,000 on the project. So altogether, um, you know, uh, it, bringing the city of Folsom into the mix has really helped with the financing and the project uh, affordability restrictions. The, the project rents are between 30 to 70%. Is that a 
good enough aerial view. The waiver of the variations from the um, guidelines to allow the developer fee to be paid uh, disproportionately than our terms require is what we're hearing from equity investors. Mm -hmm. And that's across the board. Equity investors want to ensure that that developer fee gets paid off within that uh, tax compliance period. And so that's what we're seeing across the board that that's where the market is, that they want that developer fee to be paid off. Can you tell us, Ruth, what, what opportunity area this is in? Is this considered a high resource area? This is a moderate resource area, but uh, which I'm not an expert on the designations. Right. But I do have to say that the project is right near schools, a half less than a half mile from every level of shopping. Right. So it is very well located. So this is the policy piece that I want to make sure the board is aware of. Um, when we, the Tax Credit Allocation Committee adopted resource areas and opportunity map, it was to deal with fair housing issues and to ensure that we had housing and areas of higher opportunity. And so while we're looking at the mixed income program, we're trying to make sure that we're mapping that and, know, and knowing where those projects are. Communities are much more sustainable and developments are much more sustainable and financially feasible if you have a mix of incomes and you do want to make sure that you're putting those types of projects in moderate and higher resource areas. It's very hard to sometimes come in and do 100% deeply affordable housing in those areas and to ensure that we have a mix of incomes. I also want to make sure and that policy is not part of the 4% and bond program, but as a leader in fair housing and want to making sure that we are ensuring that our dollars are spent not just efficiently, but fairly, and that we're promoting racial justice and equity into our program, we are taking a look at that and monitoring that. Mr. Chairman, uh, this is uh, Lourdes uh, Castro Ramirez, and I just wanted to follow up, Tia. I really appreciate um, you describing, you know, the level of analysis that that goes into the location, right, of these developments. It would be helpful um, from a board uh, member perspective to um, consider adding a section to the report that um, provides those indicators that you're analyzing. Um, you mentioned, for instance, uh, the location uh, near schools. Uh, the you know, be interesting uh, to see like the transit connection piece. Are there health clinics or health you know centers close by? And so, it sounds like you're, there's already a step in the process as the as the staff analyzes this, but. Um, it's not necessarily captured in the report for us. And so I would just, you know, um, ask if, um, if possible to add a section um, that um, summarizes the opportunity um, area analysis that went into, um, you know, the, the, the review of this application. Yes, ma'am. But any other questions or comments from the board? All right, seeing none, is there a motion and a second? I see a motion from the treasurer, a second. I'll second, this is Preston. Second from Preston. All right, Melissa, roll call please. Yes, on resolution 20-14, Ms. Avila Farias. Yes. Excuse me, let me um, start again. It's for re resolution 2013. Ms. Avila Farias. Yes. Ms. Avila Farias, yes. Ms. Gallagher. Yes. Ms. Gallagher, yes. Ms. Gunn. Yes. Ms. Gunn, yes. Mr. Gunning. Yes. Mr. Gunning, yes. Mr. Hunter. Yes. Mr. Hunter, yes. Ms. Johnson Hall. Yes. Ms. Johnson Hall, yes. Treasurer Ma? Yes. Treasurer Ma, yes. Director Velasquez? Yes. Director Velasquez, yes. Secretary Castro Ramirez? Yes. Secretary Castro Ramirez, yes. Mr. Prince? Yes. 
Mr. Chris, yes. Mr. Russell? Aye. Mr. Russell, aye. Ms. Sotelo? Yes. Ms. Sotelo, yes. Uh, Chairman, Resolution 20-13 is approved. All right. Thank you, Melissa. All right. Continuing. Moving on, I think item number six. <laughs> You know, I guess I did forget to ask if there's any comments from the public on that court. Was there anyone, Courtney or Melissa, that wanted to talk about that? No. Okay. Great. Let's keep going. Foucher Creek Senior. Uh, this is Preston. I'm going to uh, recuse myself. Um, uh, it's very close to lots of properties that the Housing Authority owns. And so I'll just wait for a text from Tia when this topic is up and I will turn off my video and not listen in. Thank All right, you, thank you, Preston. Uh, say say it again, Tia. Yes. Okay, go, go ahead. You're good, Preston. Shut down. All right, Kate, is this you or Ruth? Who's who's presenting? Good morning. Steven. There he is. There he is. You're up, Stephen. Go. You're on mute, bro. Yes, board. Uh, this is uh, Fancher Creek Senior Apartments. Uh, it will be located in Fresno in a highest resource area. Uh, it'll be 180 units, 144 ones, 36 twos, and they'll be restricted between 50 and 70 percent of AMI with a 55 year regulatory agreement from TCAC. The financing structure. Uh, Cali Chefe is going to be the conduit issuer of $18.5 million of tax exempt bonds. And then there's a taxable tail of $3,163,675. Bank of the West will be the construction lender. Cali Chefe will provide a permanent loan of $10,459,902. We're going to use a 35 due in 17 balloon structure. And we've underwritten it at four. 0.6% interest rate. Cali Cafe will also provide a four and a half million dollar MIP loan, and that will be due at year 17. And we're going to use a two and three quarter percent interest rate. The city of Fresno is also involved. They're providing a CDBG loan of two million two fifty nine seven hundred eighty four dollars and a home loan of $1,420,000. Um, <clears throat> we really didn't see any risks in this project. Um, the only term sheet variance was during underwriting, the market study showed that none of the units between 81 and 120 were sustainable because they couldn't achieve the 10% gap below market rate in Fresno. Are there any questions? Any questions from board members? That was just so thorough, Stephen, none, huh? But just can I, quick question. This is Eileen Gallagher, just to address the, the last comment, Stephen, you made. You mentioned the unsustainability of 80 to 120, but we don't have any here, right? Just the manager's units that are above that, is that correct? Well, it's, it's for the MIP term sheet, you have to have units between 81 and 120, except for if the market study shows that they will not be 10% below market rate. And in Fresno, that was not achievable. That's right, it's the same issue we just talked about. I understand, yeah. thank you. Yeah. It's the same issue and it's not an exception. Thank you. Good, any other board members with uh, questions, comments? All right, any members of the public have questions or comments? No, there are no uh, hands raised. All right, thanks, Courtney. All right, is there a motion and a second? This is Jonathan. I'll move adoption of resolution 20 14. Anna Marie, I'll second. Thank you, Jonathan. Thank you, Anna Marie. Melissa, roll call. Resolution 20 14, Ms. Avila Farias? Yes. Ms. Avila Farias? Yes. Ms. Gallagher? Yes. 
Ms. Gallagher, yes. Ms. Gunn? Yes. Ms. Gunn, yes. Mr. Gunning? Yes. Mr. Gunning, yes. Mr. Hunter? Yes. Mr. Hunter, yes. Ms. Johnson Hall? Yes. Ms. Johnson Hall, yes. Treasurer Ma? Yes. Treasurer Ma, yes. Director Velasquez? Yes. Director Velasquez, yes. Secretary Castro Ramirez? Yes. Secretary Castro Ramirez, yes. Mr. Russell? Aye. Mr. Russell, aye. Ms. Sotelo? All abstain. Ms. Sotelo abstain. Chairman, have 20 14 is approved. All right, thank you all. Mr. Chair? Yes. If I could um, remind the board that the mixed income program has done an analysis where we show that the average development cost per unit is coming in about $100,000 less, and we are moving more efficiently in speed, and that from application to the start of construction has come in at less than 12 months. And we do have that analysis posted on the website so the board members can go back and take a look at that and members of the public can take a look at when you present alternative financing models and more financially feasible opportunity to produce new housing is possible and meet the affordability levels that are serving what that market needs at a community level. I also want to correct Ruth's response to the Fulton project. It is in the highest resource area. So not only are you seeing projects that are serving low to low income folks, they are mixed income projects that are financially feasible because in some areas of the, uh, of the state, you do have the low end being pressing up against what market rate is in that area. So I was going to say, was gonna say Ro Roseville is very high resource. <laughs> <You're right. laughs> well, that's awesome information, Tia. Thank you, and I think that's absolutely correct. Um, so, any comments? Mr. Gunning, um, uh, Chair Gunning, can we? I, I love that idea. I think that is great to to look at that information. And so maybe when uh, uh, Tia and Kate think it's appropriate. Let's bring it back on the agenda so that we could just, you know, celebrate successes and, you know, just evaluate the, the progress of the program. Like next next meeting. next board meeting, Delilah, like have it as an well, agenda item or, or what? If they feel like it's enough data at this point, um, you know, whenever they, they're timing, but in the next, you know, two or three months, that would be helpful, I think. We'll be happy to gather that, and that will give us the last round, and so we can give you a nice analysis of the wrap-up of what was done in 19 and 20. And Great. I want to remind the board members as well, we did a workshop. Um, um, I don't know if all the board members were able to, um, to participate in that workshop, but it is posted on our website, and it provides a nice background on the state's affordable financing system. So um, that is available for board members to go back and take a look at. We try to continually provide training opportunities to the board members so they can stay in the understanding and the know about how these policies all fit together. And, and I think it's, a, it's an excellent opportunity because um, you know, having a new um, director over at HCD, it might be a good opportunity to see if this program could re replicated um, at the HCD level and so you know the mixed income concept be you know integrated within the HCD program um, you know and then potentially allow our project or our program to be more of a missing middle program as opposed to the true mixed income program that 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 is you know resulting in such a great um, outcome for us so I think it's just it's worthwhile having that discussion. Yeah, I was just going to also mention, Mr. Chairman, um, um, you know, having the opportunity to also look at um, at the data related to savings associated with um, getting these projects up much um, sooner. Uh, you know, to Tia's point, you know, the 
um, you know, there's there's the ability to capture the savings. I think will be really important um, as we look at other up, you know ways to streamline efforts. Um, let's say, for example, within HCD, um, to um, you know to ensure that the better aligned um, that quantifying the savings would be helpful. And so, Tia, you know, if if we can receive maybe some additional information on um, how you're able to quantify that um, and where, you know, uh, where you see the opportunity, right, um, to, to scale that up um, to other programs. You guys got that? Yes, sir. Okay, um, I think item number seven says you, Kate, what you think it's Helen that's presenting on report back on multifamily. So that's the with us. Oh, Mr. Prince is back. So we're on item seven, right? That's correct, Mr. Chairman, and it would be Kate Ferguson. Who's up? Okay. Yes, ahead, Kate. And I am trying to share my screen right now. I'm clicking on it, but it's not sharing, Courtney. Courtney, uh, can you try that again? I will try again. Kate you, Kate, you should be receiving a request to share your screen. Yeah, I don't. Let me see. Show my start slideshow. Is it sharing? We're still waiting to view your screen. Yeah, I'm clicking on show my screen. Nothing's happening. Um, let's try that one more time, Courtney. Okay, you should be receiving the request. Do we have her presentation here? She is on as a presenter. Um, we we practiced this right before it started, so it, it was yep. working. It, it's just not coming up. It won't, I'm clicking show my screen and it's not working. Ugh. Do we have her slides? Do we have her slides here? that we can just, someone here can click through them. Courtney, try one more time. Okay, and if you want to email them to me, I, I can run them for you. I did send them to you this morning. Okay, then we should be able to do that. But try one more time. All right, here we go. And you should be receiving the request. Yeah, I've got it. It's not working. Okay. Yeah, I don't have. Yeah. Just one moment. Yeah. It's on her end. Do you have it? I did not receive an email. Um, let me see if. Here we go. Okay. And change presenter. Just one moment. There we go. Okay. So are you managing this, Courtney, then? Yes. Sorry. You'll have to tell me when to move forward. No, that's fine. I'm happy to. Um, so you can go ahead and click to the, the next slide. Um, good morning, Chair Gunning and members of the board. My name is Kate Ferguson and I am the Director of Multifamily Programs. I'm here today to request the renewal of this conversation related to the Executive Director's Approval Authority for Multifamily Loans. This conversation has been sidelined since it was originally introduced in May of 2018 solely because of other priorities. Um, and today I just wanted to 
refresh the memories of those board members that were here for the 2018 discussion and give a summary to new members. Today, I'm not requesting any action, um, but I anticipate we will be coming back with a recommendation in future months. Next slide, please. There we go. Uh, since November of 2001, when the lending authority was initially established, no changes have been made. Have been made. As we all know, over the same time period, we have witnessed dramatic changes to the complexities and costs related to developing affordable housing in the state of California and throughout the country. And the need continues to rise every year. In response to the ongoing dynamics of lending in this industry, especially over the past five years, Kelly Tefe has strategically continued to increase the quality and quantity of our approach to underwriting project economic and financial feasibility. Additionally, the priority of ensuring the efficient deployment of and use of the resources to which we have access has become paramount. Improvements to the dis disciplines of due diligence, underwriting, and risk assessment have translated to a more effective and meaningful understanding of the risk profile of our portfolio. And with new expertise leading our asset management team in the person of Andre Massey, our deputy director, the Kelly Tefe portfolio continues to outperform industry averages, as you can see here. Finally, we have tightened the process and format for the recommendation and approval of new opportunities to the Senior Loan Committee. The goal is to ensure that relevant information, which is key to assessing risk and making lending decisions, is presented in a transparent and proactive manner. These disciplines will ensure the composition of our portfolio remains strong going forward. Next slide, please. We have analyzed all of the project approvals submitted to the board since 2000, 2015. Not surprisingly, as the costs of development have increased and as Kelly Chaffee has moved to providing more first lien lending, the dollar amount of the approval requests has increased and the number of deals that must come to the board for approvals continues to increase. And you can see on this slide that the same amount of projects have come before the board at the midway point of 2020 as there were in all of 2015 and 16. And the amount of projects that went to the board in 2018 alone equaled the combined total of the previous three years. Next slide, please. As you can see, the average loan size coming to the board continues to steadily increase. And these numbers are skewed um, even these increases are skewed due to legacy loans from our small loan program, which we no longer offer, but which we still have in our pipeline. First lien loans in today's market will very rarely fall below 10 million. Given that Kelly Chafe has strategically entered the permanent first lien lending market and continues to pair this product with our subsidy debt, I expect we will see average loan sizes continuing to increase over the near and long term. I fully expect that this will mean that the percentage of loans that we have to bring to the board for final approval will exceed 50% by the end of this fiscal year. This slide represents next slide, sorry. This slide represents the percentage of loans currently in Kelly Chafe's pipeline and where they fall in terms of their size. As you can see, more than 50% of our pipeline has loan amounts of 10 million or more. As I said, as we move more strategically into the first lien lending permanent loan market, I expect this percentage to increase, especially since our current pipeline still includes those legacy small loans that are less than $5 million. Next slide, please. So in the contents, in the context of the executive director's lending authority, the analysis that we have been doing along with our move uh, to larger permanent loans and current lending authority, there, there's a disconnect between the approved lending authority for the executive director and the, just the general size of the permanent loans that we are doing. We no longer are targeting small loans and we have discontinued our small loan program to provide loans of less than $5 million. There are exceptions to that, but it is not one of our, our programs at this time. Um, Given the focus on using state resources efficiently at all levels and permanent debt amounts continuing to increase, the disconnect is, is very apparent. 
As an example, the Cal HFA MIP program contemplates Cal HFA being the permanent lender on the MIP list. There are some exceptions to that, but one of the conditions to the program is that we restrict permanent debt service coverage ratios to a maximum of 1.20 times. We do this to ensure that the properties are not over leveraged, but still, and that they still have strong project economics, which are further enhanced by the requirement that all subsidy units be at rent levels at least 10% below market. What this has translated to in terms of average permanent loan amounts for all the MIP deals done in fiscal year 1920 is that the average loan amount is 26, for permanent loans, is 26.6 million. The highest loan amount is 64 million and the lowest loan amount was 6.6. To normalize this a bit, I can throw out the high, any loans over 50 million and any loans under 10 million. And the average of the permanent loans for the MIP projects from 19, from our initial NOFA in the spring of 2019 to our final round, which we just completed, is $24 million. So still over, well over $20 million, and that's the average loan amount. So as a competitive lender in the market, our ability to move quickly through approval and closing is imperative, especially with the focus on moving forward shovel-ready projects. I anticipate that our current approval structure will require almost every new loan to come to the board as we pursue our new first lien lending strategy. Thus, at our next board meeting, I'd like to come forward with a discussion item related to modifying and a potential proposal related to modifying the approval authority of the executive director. And with that, I'll take any questions. Thank you. Hi, this is uh, Tina Johnson Hall. And just wanted to say um, that this is something that I'm really glad that staff has brought back to us, um, in part because it really supports Tia's uh, guidance around making us more efficient so that we are more competitive in the market. Um, this is an absolute that we should consider in my mind uh, for several reasons. Um, all of, I'll just mention and underline some of the ones that Kate has already mentioned, uh, which include the fact that we now have a staff that is very, very different from what it might have looked like. The leadership team is very different than what it looked like years ago. The folks that we that uh, Tia has brought on board includes in that six or seven year period include folks like Kate and, and Andre, who I know well. They've been in banking collectively for 50 plus years and know this industry better than the average um, folks, even in the financial institutions world. So I would back them 100 percent. We also have Don Caviar and his team who has they are the leaders now. They've won award after award after award. How many times do we have to hear it? I'll hear it another 20 years. Keep doing it, Don. But I think what it says is we now have a leadership team that is considered subject matter expertise in the field. I want to also layer that with the fact that there are many eyes on these projects that Kate didn't even mention, and they're doing their own separate underwriting and review, including HCD, all of the financial institutions. We saw four or five projects today that had no less than three or four subordinate lenders or lenders involved. So there are a lot of eyes on these projects, including uh, the, uh, and not, in, not just from the the debt side, but also from the syndication side as well. The uh, All of the syndicators underwrite these things. Um, and they all have a vested interest in not only ensuring that these, from a profitability standpoint, that these deals come to fruition, but from an economic, social, and um, uh, other investment aspect that these, these uh, deals are uh, successful for, for many, many years to come. Um, so I do believe that we should, uh, just from the board's efficiency, in addition to that, that we should be looking at no greater than 30% of the deals. And if that means that, that we need to 
push that down to the staff to let them do their work, then that's the way it should be. That's why they're here. They have the expertise to shuttle these through. And um, as uh, Kate mentioned, it'll make us more efficient uh, and uh, market leader in doing so. And then finally, I just wanted to uh, just say that um, if you look at our asset position, which is which I think is some our asset portfolio, which altogether is somewhere in the neighborhood of around four billion dollars, that's the size of a small a regional bank here in California. And within those uh, leadership teams, they have credit officers or folks that uh, oversee credit that very easily have 10, 15 million credit authority. So what we are doing or what, what is being proposed here is very, very consistent with uh, uh, any other, while we're not a financial institution in the conventional sense, we are a financial institution. We are the state's financial institution. So I don't see any reason why our internal uh, best practices should not mimic what we're seeing on the conventional side. And I'll leave it there. Now, the question that I have for Kate is, Kate, this, this under this proposal, are you still thinking that there will be deals that may be under 10 million that you still might want to bring before the board for other reasons? Can you speak to that? Yeah, and we would bring things, and we have brought deals um, before the board that anything that, um, if we're seeing something that is a um, modification really to the terms of a program, we brought several deals to the board at, at late last year um, that were involved in the MIP program because we there was a, a disconnect between the timing of the state tax credits and we talked through with the board sort of how we could best support the deals and we ended up going way over the initial NOFA amounts in terms of funding and but anything like that regardless of the size of the loan we would bring to the board um, but what this would allow us to do is really more efficiently we do a very in-depth analysis our new credit officer Sheena Co is is state of the art i don't know what else to say about her she's amazing and we do an analysis that goes through um sheena's analysis my analysis we do a peer review with our legal we do a peer review with asset management and that's all before we go before don and tia for our final recommendation and presentation and that is a very detailed review so all of this is happening for every single deal and it's important, my, my focus is to maintain the quality of the portfolio as well as to increase the portfolio and become um, a more relevant player in the market. Um, I think we, Kelly Tafe brings a lot to the market and so it's very important that we do a holistic review of every project that we are investing any public subsidy in. So yes, Tia, Tina, sorry, Tina, Tia, Tina. <laughs> Sorry, Miss Johnson, um, Johnson Hall. Thank you, Miss Johnson Hall. Thank you. And I just uh, want to clarify that Miss Johnson Hall referred to um, the uh, the experience that Andre and I have being over fifty years, and I just want to say that's combined our experience. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Wait, point it out, Kate. There, there you go. Uh, Ms. Johnson Hall, thank you for those comments. I agree 100%. Uh, Mr. Russell, sir. Yes, uh, Stephen Russell here. Um, so first of all, I want to say that that I really am uh, impressed with the, the, the level, the quality of work from the Cali HFA and our staff. Uh, and that what I hear from the developer community, from my members, is every time there's an idea for a new funding program, people ask, couldn't we have Cali HFA administer it? And, and, and I, I, with all due respect to, to other agencies that might be doing it, Cal HFA has an entrepreneurial spirit and an ability to be entrepreneurial in ways that has been extraordinary. And so I want to give all due credit to Tia and the team uh, and uh, board members who have preceded me and sit with me now for, for, for bringing that about. So I think that is really remarkable. Um, the, uh, I want, want to be clear, though, that when, when, it looks, when we talk about board oversight, it isn't necessarily just about the underwriting and knowing that the quality of underwriting, which is excellent, is being done. Um, 
we, we put eyes on the project. And so this, this comes to the question of what should we be seeing? Uh, and yes, we are a bank and yes, we are a large bank, but we are not just a bank. We have public interests that we have to represent and we have other, other social goals that, that are overlaid that, that other financial institutions may not necessarily adopt. And so I just want to be, while we give authority that allows for the organization to be nimble on the, the bread and butter of what we do, I want to make sure that we still see enough projects that because it's when we look at a project, I'm a project-based learner, and I will say that we have not refused any projects. I think in the time I've been on this board, we have made some improvements, but every discussion, every time we have a discussion, it casts forward and improves every project that follows, the oversight that staff provides, the depth of, of understanding. And so I just want to make sure when we set a limit, if maybe 30%, as, as, as Tina has suggested, uh, is the right 30% of projects, I'm not sure. I just want to make sure we see enough so that we're, we are forced into an oversight role and forced to educate ourselves in the nuts and bolts of enough projects in the course of a year that we understand that policies are being pursued, that other objectives have, have been suggested by the secretary here, um, that we are looking at and enumerating these, these other benefits. So I uh, am all in favor of raising the limit. I just want to make sure it is at that right level that maintains our level of oversight and the broader policy goals uh, that we're charged with pursuing. Excellent comments. Thank you, Stephen. Uh, anything else from any other board members? Eileen, I, th I think you're still on mute. Yeah, sorry. Um, I mean, Gallagher here. Uh, I just want to echo some of those comments that Stephen just made. I, I'm very supportive of, you know, changing the delegation authority. I think it makes sense for us to be focusing on policy issues more than some of the weeds on this stuff. But I agree, you know, to Stephen's point that understanding, you know, to understand the projects themselves and how they fit together helps inform some of the policy. So, you know, whether and how to tease out the right exceptions for the board to look at or the thresholds i think is a you know open question i defer to the staff on that in terms of when they bring it back but i do think that um, makes a lot of sense that we're at a higher level but also aware of what's going on and, and maybe there's a, a balance of what what we do see in terms of a report of what has been approved and whether it's you know you know as the asset management kind of um, template that i know has been developed has been gives a snapshot of where projects are and how they're performing mm -hmm. Um, maybe part of that is, is, is new deals get added to that mix. Okay. All right. Good. Any other comments on Delilah? Yeah, go ahead. Delilah. Can I ask? Sorry. Oh, did you have a follow up, Eileen? Yeah, I did have a follow up question, just and it's a, a little bit of a tangent, but one of the one of the bullet points in your prior um, slide discussed that there are no, no COVID. Um, forbearance provisions have been approved. And I was just curious of whether we've been getting those. And that's something that maybe away from this, this item, just to hear a little bit about what is happening, if anything, on the on the ground and how products are performing or what, if any, stresses we're seeing. Yeah, I, am I, yeah. Um, I would say that um, to date, we've had very few requests for any forbearance. I think, um, uh, I'm sorry? We haven't had any requests for forbearance. We've had a couple of requests to utilize operating reserve that have been approved, but we haven't had anyone officially ask for a forbearance. That's true. I'm sorry, I was I was going to go there, but that's true. Um, it's as opposed to a forbearance request. We have a robust um, process that we set up immediately, but we haven't seen that yet. Um, we may see some of that as this as the COVID crisis continues, but to date, we really haven't. And when I talk to my colleagues at other banks and Ms. Johnson Hall may want to respond to this, um, people aren't really seeing, you know, huge problems with that yet. So I don't know, Ms. Johnson Hall, if you'd like to respond to that as well, but we're not seeing it yet. Yeah, you know, even it's interesting because even the ones who initially, uh, we did receive a few forbearance requests early on. Um, and even uh, many of those have been withdrawn. Um, I think it's in, it's in part because there's been a flood of capital, free capital coming in from um, uh, various foundations and uh, crowdfunding and other efforts have made it really easy for folks to get free money that really wasn't on the table in the past. And so they, though that money does not come with the um, belts and suspenders that 
uh, even Cal Let Your Money comes with. It's it's just do what you need to do to make things right with your organization money. Um, and so um, because of that flood, that new flood of dollars coming in, um, the people, folks just don't have the same need that they might have had uh, several months ago when uh, the pandemic initially hit. That's interesting because the legislature still passing bills. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's not stopping them. But there's no, no problem there. <laughs> no, you, I agree. Um, I still think that there that there still will be a need for um, those dollars because um, I, I think that what you're seeing is a, a shift in what the challenge really is. So uh, initially, folks were thinking. It was going to be one thing, and now there's uh, more of a focus on renters. And are we, as an example, with housing, and are we providing sufficient dollars for those folks who are losing their jobs to eat? Um, so it's it's all the the sort of affiliated challenges that come along with being in a pandemic that's uh, affecting many of the the folks that uh, are dollars house. Delilah, you had your hand up. Do you still have a comment? I, I did. Um, I just wanted to say that, you know, the underwriting um, team at CalJFA has so improved over the last several years. And I just, you know, the way the board uh, memos are laid out and the evaluative process that happens has, has improved so tremendously that, you know, I have a huge vote of confidence uh, in the teams. Um, you know, checks and balances within the organization. Um, and I think that's, uh, it speaks a lot to the professionalism that Tia's brought to the table, um, as well as Dawn and, and, and the rest of the team. So Kate, I'm, I'm very supportive of the idea of, um, you know, creating parameters that really um, we kind of increase the, the executive director's authority. Um, I think that from a oversight uh, standpoint however we just need to to complement it with the checks and balances that we could do uh, whether that becomes quarterly reports or whether that becomes um, something that we look at at the audit committee to just you know um, do do random sampling or you know just to to try to figure out um, and to make sure that um, the underwriting is is in place as proposed and is really happening. I think that's from from our perspective, uh, an obligation of a board is to oversee and to ensure, um, you know, ensure that quality control is in place. So I, I have no problem with um, only seeing a percentage of the projects come to the full board for review, but I just want to kind of create a program that allows the full board to uh, get a report back on the projects that were approved and how they were approved and some of the uh, some of the um, qualitative um, information or, or or just you know parameters that were approved um, at the staff level. I think that would also help us. And then to, to Mr. Russell's point, from a policy perspective, it's huge and really important for us to see what developers are act which developers are active, what projects are being proposed, uh, the areas in which those projects are being proposed, and the impact that we're having um, throughout the, the state. Because I think it helps inform us in a lot of different ways, not only in our role as Cal HFA directors, but also in our role in, in, in other areas and other committees that we serve on. So I think that um, to the extent that we can keep, uh, maybe it becomes um, a portion of the executive director's report back, but if we could keep um, the, um, you know, the connection to the board. Um, you still there? Okay. You still are you muted? Delilah, are you muted? Mm 
I'm not sure what happened. All right, well, I, I think we got the gist of it, Tia and Kate. I, I, I think you hear clearly from all the board members um, when you do bring it back, some sort of metrics around what deals we look at. You, you guys squared away? Right. And, and so let me just add what we were uh, thinking because we wanted this critical feedback and understand what you wanted our parameters to be. But we, for the first time, do actually have a set of underwriting guidelines. And so any deviations, regardless of the dollar amount from those underwriting guidelines, it was our intent to continue to bring those to the board. Um, any deviations from adopted or approved program requirements, those exceptions to those would be continued to brought to the board. And anything new or innovative that we are doing as a result of a, a legislative uh, allocation of funds or regardless of that kind of dollar amount, we would continue to bring those type of things to the board. What we're, our goal really is, is to engage and get direction from the board on more policy and direction and ensure that we're aligned with the state's unmet housing needs and that routine type of multifamily projects that meet the standards that you all have already approved don't come to you for approval again. And so those are the parameters that we were looking at and really wanted to get some impact from you all as to what it was that you all wanted to continue to see and where you wanted us to do so that we can continue to be flexible and efficient and streamlined. Great. Great. Awesome. Hey, wonderful comments. Thanks, everyone. Um, let's move on. I know we're waiting here with bated breath. And as it does approach noon in two hours, Frances, no pressure, but uh, you're <laughs> up, my friend. OK, can you all hear me now? Mm -hmm. We got you, go. Great. Good morning, Chairman, Executive Director, and members of the board, College of A colleagues, members of the uh, public. My name is Francesc Martí, and I'm the Director of Policy and Legislation at College of A. And I'm going to be giving you a very quick overview of the legislative landscape at the federal and state level. So please see this presentation as a reference. I'm not going to be going into every detail, um, but I'm just going to be providing a general sense. And afterwards, uh, the, direct, the executive director of Civil Act and TCAC, Judith Blackwell, will make a few remarks at the end of my presentation. So let's start with Congress, uh, which is where the action has been during the pandemic. Um, in slide three, you'll see a visual guide of uh, fully enacted COVID uh, stimulus bills to date. There's been four, although the fourth one is referred to as phase 3.5. Um, the only bill so far fully enacted that has provided housing provisions or housing relief has been the CARES Act. Uh, the provisions are in there for you to look at. I think a lot of you are familiar with them. And then um, in terms of phase four proposals, uh, the House did pass its version of phase four. This is called the HEROES Act. Uh, it provides really robust uh, you know, additional housing assistance, uh, $100 billion for uh, rental assistance, $75 billion for mortgage assistance, uh, extends uh, the forbearance and foreclosure uh, protections, establishes a uh, mortgage service or liquidity facility, a lot more funding for HUD. Uh, but beyond the uh, proposal that the House has passed, what are we really expecting for phase four? So the Senate initially was not considering another stimulus bill. Now it is, and now it has indicated that it intends to pass legislation for a uh, phase four of stimulus before it recesses in mid-August. We expect the Senate to start drafting uh, a phase four bill in the next couple of weeks uh, while concurrently negotiating with Senate Dems and with House uh, leadership. Um, the Senate majority has indicated that its priorities are um, individual assistance, social stimulus checks, um, liability protections, and it also has singled openness to un, uh, more unrestricted state and local aid. Uh, our housing advocates are pushing hard for many of the provisions in the HEROES Act and also for strengthening the uh, housing credit and credit equity bonds. Infrastructure bill. So you have probably heard that on July 1st, the House passed a 
a really big 1.5 trillion infrastructure bill. It's called the Moving Forward Act. It, um, the reason they, they passed this bill is because the highway uh, trust fund uh, needs to be extended uh, by the end of September. And, and Senators were hoping that they could include this big infrastructure packet as part of that extension. That's probably not going to happen, that this, this hasn't gotten traction in the Senate. Uh, however, it includes a lot of what houses have been asking for on the house, on the uh, housing credit uh, bond side, and also substantial amount of of uh, housing funding. So it, it it's good in terms of gaining visibility for a lot of the items that we've been asking for. Federal budget um, uh, slide seven. Uh, the the house version of the transportation, housing, and urban development budget uh, appropriations bill, THUD bill. Uh, was released earlier this week and it was passed by the subcommittee. Just two things to note there, uh, significant annual increases to the ongoing annual funding at HUD and then a one-time $49 billion uh, appropriation uh, for housing relief uh, to deal with uh, pandemic recovery. Uh, so even though the House is moving forward with its uh, budget process, the Senate is stalled at the moment. We don't expect there to be an agreement before the fiscal year. Uh, the new fiscal, federal fiscal year starts on October 1st. Uh, so what we expect to see is a continuing resolution um, that will uh, fund the, the federal uh, government uh, um, through the election. And, uh, and then depending on the result of the election, uh, you know, uh, they'll pass the, the full appropriations bill after that. So that so now we'll move to federal regulations. Um, I'll try to be quick on this. Uh, uh, so on the IRS front, we got really good news from the IRS uh, on July 1st. They provided a, they published a notice which provides significant relief, light tech relief to owners um, and uh, and light tech allocators. Uh, and and you have the provisions in the slide. I won't go into them. On the Community Reinvestment Act front, I think we've mentioned previously that uh, the Office of the Controller of the Currency had a what we view as a as a negative proposed rule uh, to reform CRA. They actually went ahead and finalized that rule, and that rule, uh, in in the opinion of, of most housing experts, will weaken incentives for banks to invest in affordable housing. The details of the rule are are there. The only thing I'll say is. Although it takes effect on in, on October 1st, is really complex and it'll probably take years to implement. The House of Representatives has already put a resolution to nullify this rule. There's been lawsuits brought up to stay the implementation. And depending on the outcome of the election, a new controller of the currency could swiftly revoke this rule. So FHFA and FHA, I'll just say that they are um, extending uh, uh, the current uh, COVID foreclosure, forbearance, and eviction protections through the end of August. So that's a bird's eye view of what's going on in DC. And now let's turn to uh, to the state, uh, slide 11. So it's been a really atypical year um, because of the COVID-19 crisis. Uh, and you know that the legislature was out of session for uh, two months, uh, the list of active bills has been significantly pared down. Um, and as the chairman said, uh, we, were ex uh, we were expecting the uh, legislature to return on the 13th, but that's been postponed until the 27th. They have very little time in their official cal calendar until August 31st to move bills through, through the second house. And uh, I have a list of bills here that the uh, that each house has identified as ho uh, priority housing bills. I won't go into each of them, but, uh, but uh, you have them here. And then on the next slide, slide 13, um, I have some other prominent bills that did not kind of feature in the official housing package in each chamber, but are um, significant nonetheless and are live because they are in the second chamber. So now state budget. Um, you know, this, uh, the the state budget was was signed last week by the governor, and in slide 17, it, we just provide a, a bird's eye view of the budget. Um, so, given the economic crisis and the need for fiscal restraint, all of you are aware that um, 
there were cuts uh, across many areas and uh, College of A was not spared. Um, in fact, our AV 101 resources that we got in last year's budget uh, uh, did see a 250 million reduction. What the legislature did is they maintained the reductions in the main revise, but they added a trigger that if uh, the state gets 14 billion in unrestricted aid from the federal government by October, then the budget year cuts, so that's the 2020-2021 uh, cuts get restored. The hour year cuts do not get restored. So for that, what that means for college FA is out of the 95 that was uh, projected for 2020-21, um, uh, 45 is, is, is cut right now, and that would be reverted if the federal funds come in. However, uh, the uh, out year cuts, the 120 million in 2021-22 and the 85 million in 2022-23, those would not be reverted. So, uh, Lastly, I, I think you, you see a, a pie chart on the right. Um, this has the main el uh, uh, elements of housing funding in the budget this year. Uh, of note, I just mentioned the of note to Cal HFA, uh, the national mortgage settlement, 330 million there, 300 million of that. So the vast majority is coming to Cal HFA for uh, housing counseling and mortgage assistance, as Tia mentioned in her opening remarks. Um, we will be providing more information to the board on that uh, in August. And uh, the other element I do want to touch upon is uh, the state light tech piece. It's really good news uh, that the uh, state light tech program is continuing at another 500 million for another year. Um, and it's also very good news uh, that uh, the state light tech program is exempt from the new 5 million uh, annual cap on business uh, Tax credit is something that investors had been very vocal about. It was necessary to maintain state light tech out of that in order to maintain uh, the credit pricing. Um, and so uh, I also mentioned in terms of state light tech that a 200 million reservation, up to 200 million dollar reservation for for college FA for these credits also remains in the light tech language. And lastly, and I think this is a good handoff for. Um, Ms. Blackwell, uh, the housing trailer bill also calls for a new uh, TCAC and SIDLAC scoring system um, and, and set some criteria about how that should look like. So um, I know that was a lot. Um, I'll pause for um, a few seconds to see if there's any questions before I turn it over to Ms. Blackwell. Um, I don't know if I, I see Preston has his hand up, Frances, but I think I know I'd like a copy of that chart. That was good. That was I excellent. That, Thank you. I, I sent that email already asking for that. <laughs> Thank, <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. See, all, all of us thinking alike on that. It was just good information, Frances. Thank you. Thank it you. Was. Fantastic. <laughs> and you know, every time I sit through a presentation like that, I, I just think that, you know, in the 1980s, HUD was the second highest funded department at the federal level, and then its budget was cut by more than 60%. And if it had just been fully funded over the last 30 years, it would have been $1.2 trillion going into affordable housing. And if California has 10% of the population, 120 billion could have been invested in affordable housing, and we wouldn't be where we are today trying to play catch up. And you know, I totally appreciate whether it's 48 billion at the federal level for public housing or, or uh, you know, two billion a year being proposed. I think of Santiago for homelessness and affordable housing. Uh, I, I, it just seems like we're playing catch up, and it's to me, it's just a stark reminder of like the bad decisions that happen. And then, of course, what I think about then is what are the bad decisions we're making today that they're going to have to live with down the road. And so, just want to take the moment for us to always think: let's make the right decision. Take a little bit more time, get the data, and make the right decision, so people aren't cleaning up after us. But sorry for the editorial, but I did love the presentation and it made me go down that path of, man, things should have been different. Thank you so much. And, and we'll make sure Secretary that- Secretary, uh, don't laugh at me. I see the secretary laughing at me. I'm sorry. No, no, no. I, I was just going to say right on, uh, Preston and uh, Mr. Chairman, I just wanted to mention also, uh, very much appreciate, you know, Francesca, your very thorough um, presentation uh, from, you know, federal to the 
to the state level. And then just on the, the state level uh, budget, um, just you know, want to um, reiterate um, how committed our governor is in his entire administration to continue to preserve and expand um, affordable housing opportunities. And I think the budget, despite you know the fiscal environment that we're living in, um, it demonstrates right that um, we are very committed across you know uh, state government to doing everything possible to preserve um, uh, affordable housing opportunities, but also to expand affordable housing opportunities. And, and so, you know, great uh, presentation, Francesc. Uh, that slide that shows um, what's in the budget, I think, you know, um, to the extent that we can share that more you know, publicly, I think it, it will also help um, uh, better sort of um, explain the resources that are being, you know, deployed um, in this, you know, budget year. So appreciate um, the way that you were able to present that in a visual form. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Frances. Judith, long time no see. The floor hey. is yours. <laughs> Hi. Well, um, thank you for having me. Particularly, let me thank uh, Executive Director Tia Boltman Patterson for being kind enough to let me present and also to the board thank you guys for um, allowing me to present and Francesc you gave me a perfect segue because it is true that at the state level housing trailer bill number AB 83 um, has provided us oh well let me also say that I'm just happy to be here because I have been here since I have been executive director of TCAC since That's August cool. of last year, and I have been executive director of SIDLAC since basically the last day of January of this year. So 10 months in one position and about five and a half months in the other. We've had a lot of changes going on during this time. Um, and in the context of the changes and the improvements that we've been doing across the board with regard to our regulations, um, we also received housing trailer bill AB83, which um, has asked us to improve our scoring system in a manner that maximizes the efficient use of public subsidy and benefit uh, created through the private activity bonds, uh, which is of course CIVAC, and the low income housing tax credit programs, which is of course TCAP. Now it's interesting because AB83 gave us some specific requirements uh, with regard to our scoring changes, but everything that they have requested is something that we already have in our, um, in our current regulations. And so I just wanna point that out and we will continue along this pathway to provide what they requested. But let me show you a chart. If you look here, AB 83 asked us to um, focus on our scoring system with regard to the number and size of units developed, including local incentives provided to increase density. If you look to the middle, you'll see we currently have in place provisions at TCAC with regard to the final tiebreaker and housing type, and with regard to our 4%, and with regard to the tax credit unit ranking. SIDLAC also makes distinctions with regard to large family and uh, leveraging in their competitive process. And for your reading pleasure, we give you this, the uh, regulations so that you can read them if you choose to the right. Uh, the next thing that AB 83 asks for is, proxim is that we change our scoring to, uh, to reward proximity to amenities. As you'll see, TCAC already has rewards with regard to site amenities. And we also make use of the opportunity maps. SIDLAC also makes use of site amenities. I'm switching to the next, next slide now. Uh, I'm sorry. Is that the whole page? There's not another slide there. All right. Um, we also have uh, our, our asked by AB83 to focus on location of the development. As you see, TCAC has that focus in its 9% set-asides and geographical regional apportionments, which you're all very familiar with. SIDLAC also has a rural project pool. Once again, to the right, you see the regs where that's already uh, outlined. 
Next, AB 83 reminds us that we should focus on the delivery of housing of affordable to very low and extremely low income households. And you will see that uh, TCAC has a provision, provision 10325C4, which rewards that. And SIDLAC also rewards that under section 5230C1 5, uh, with regard to exceeding the minimum income restrictions. So as you can see, um, we're very much in alignment with the legislature in terms of what we have been focusing on. Um, TCAC and SIDLAC did do uh, two major listening tours. I'm sorry that this is 2020 and 2019. Um, and we gathered ideas and feedbacks to improve the efforts to increase affordable housing statewide and solicited feedback prior to publishing the proposed reg changes that have begun um, in 2019 and are continuing through 2020. Um, we also have convened multiple working groups to review our regulations. We have an external working group and an internal working group. The external working group, uh, which uh, is headed by uh, um, CHC, and it has a diverse working group made up of for-profit and non-profits and both rural and non-rural areas, uh, urban areas, Etc. It is very, very diverse group, and they are hammering out some suggestions for us. And we have our internal working group, which has met at least five times and uh, has alignment because not only does it include TCAC and SIGLAC, but it also has included members from HCD and CalHFA, so that we can assure that the product that we're going to produce this summer will have input both from our um, stakeholders externally and our internal stakeholders at the state. Um, one of the things that we have uh, accomplished this year is that Assembly Bill 101 was signed by the governor in July of 2019. Uh, of course, it increased our state tax credit authority by 500 million. And the point of it was to maximize the efficient production of newly constructed housing units. We've almost doubled the number of housing units produced by our 4% program because of this. And we have doubled that production in the first six months of this year. So I have great hope for what our final end of the year production is going to be. Um, we also made, made use of our joint TCAC SIDLAC application, uh, which is in furtherance of other goals that we have had for our uh, various departments to become aligned. Um, this, those reg changes were published in August of 2019 with a public comment period through September of 2019. The final proposed regs were adopted in October. The application deadline was on November 15th. Um, I just point these dates out to let you know how quickly we move to implement these programs in order to make certain that we are getting housing to Californians as quickly as humanly possible. Um, our second application deadline was January 17th. And at this point, nearly all of the credits that we received from uh, AB 101 have been expended. And as I mentioned, the number of units has already doubled. Um, I just switched to another slide that is discussing additional reg changes, just to let you know that we have been very busy in this past 10 months. We also passed regulations for tenant relocation protection because we discovered that there was a loophole and we needed to require developers to provide adequate relocation assistance for displaced tenants, particularly when you're doing um, rehab projects. We also reintroduced the SRO housing type, which allows, and by doing that, that is allowing for older SRO units in need of rehab to compete for the 9% credits. Without reintroducing that, um, because the SRO housing type had been eliminated in 2017, it was making it impossible for them to get rehab. Um, also with regard to the opportunity maps, we have focused very much and I think, uh, thank you Tia for pointing out how useful opportunity maps are in terms of um, equity for tenants and making certain that they are in um, places where economic development um, is occurring and, and areas where, they, where tenants can thrive. Um, we've additionally looked at our opportunity maps and for rural areas, we're now measuring them at the block level rather than at the track level to provide a finer level of analysis. And we've uh, recently excluded military bases 
from the analysis. Um, as we all know, the main goal, major goal that we've been hearing from the legislature and from the treasurer and um, throughout California is we have to increase housing production. As you'll see, uh, in 2017, we produced 14,000 new units in that year. In 2018, 19,700. In 2019, 21,311. And you will see that in the first six months of 2020, we've already produced 15,000 units. So at this rate, um, as I said, um, I have high hopes for doubling, almost doubling what we've seen in years past. Um, one of the other things that we focused on and is a thing that uh, the trailer bill asked us to focus on is costs. And we've uh, produced a joint cost statement based on the uh, research that has been done and reviewing what's out there. We've looked at the construction costs of affordable housing. This joint cost statement was completed and published in a collaborative study in December of 2019 with TCAC, CalHFA, Oregon Housing and Community Services and Washington State HFA. Uh, we looked at the cost drivers regarding construction costs for low income housing in the region. And we discovered that basically the uh, LIHTC housing costs are on par with the market rate housing costs. There is no real difference. Uh, there is no squandering of public funds. Uh, we are doing quite well. So that's a wonderful thing. We also resol resolved an issue uh, with regard to workforce housing. And we basically refocused on the uh, very closely on some of the legal requirements for TCAC. And we realized that we can now allow TCAC to approve affordable low income housing projects with a preference to school district employees without violating the federal public use requirements. Um, this has paved the way for such projects in the future and will contribute to economic development in California. Um, we also have focused in this short window of time on um, a congressional piece of legislation called the Further Consolidated Appropriations Act of 2020, which was introduced by uh, Representative Mike Thompson in order to provide an additional $98 million of 9% credits to be used in 2020 and 2021 for the 13 counties that were struck by wildfires in 27 and 2018. So this was passed in December of, um, of last year. It is now uh, July and we already have the uh, provisions in place. The proposed regulation changes were published January, 2020. Uh, we had two public comment periods uh, through February 12th and May 18th. We did multiple conference calls and working group meetings. Um, we included all of the 13 counties in those calls. And um, we put our final proposed reg changes out and, for, and they were adopted on June 17th of 2020. Uh, we're moving at breakneck speed again, just like we did with the AB 101. And the application deadline was July 1 and my staff is hard at work right now reviewing those applications. We are two and a half times oversubscribed over in terms of the requests. So we have $240 million of requests for $98 million worth of um, disaster credit. So I would consider this to be a highly successful program. One of the other things that we have focused on, which is kind of dull, but Apparently, the developers care about it quite a bit, and that is our 8609 placed in service reviews. We have thrown all the resources that we can at this problem. Um, we've increased the placed in service staff by 50% by adding another manager and two additional analysts. We're in the process of hiring an attorney to review the lease writers and other legal documents to take some of the weight off of staff who's also doing the financial reviews. Um, our compliance staff, due to COVID-19, had to suspend their physical inspections, so we cross-trained that staff and also redirected them to placed in service reviews. As a result of that change, and because of weekly meetings, status reports, 
from July, from January of this year through July, the backlog with regard to place 10 service applications has been reduced by 35%. Uh, the pale blue line is the backlog, and you can see it shrinking from January through July. The long, longer line is the applications that still come in. Um, but as you can see, we have reduced our backlog by 35% already. Um, this is another chart. I like this chart a lot. My staff put it together. Um, on the orange line, you will see um, the document. There's, there's actually three steps to the place in, in service process. One is completing the regulatory agreements. One is analyst review, which is the orange line, and one is final review by a manager, which is the gray line. So you can see that uh, the managers have put in a Herculean effort to reduce their back, their individual backlog. The analysts have as well. And with regard to the regulatory agreement, there has been an improvement, and you will see much, much more once we add that additional attorney. Maybe. So, um, so I've what? basically focused on TCAC, but let me also mention that we've been very busy at CIDLEC as well. CIDLEC did make uh, changes to adapt to the increased volume of applications due to AB 101, which is now competitive. Uh, CIDLEC has added a manager and three additional analysts, and we have reviewed and adjusted our internal processes to accommodate basically uh, a tripling of the applications that have come in. Um, in addition, because of the fact that this has become a competitive environment uh, and, and the bond allocation has become a very precious resource, we've worked very closely with our board to help develop definitional changes in order to restrict the funding of cosmetic rehab projects because we just really are not in a position to spend that resource on those types of things at this time. We've also um, changed our regulations to allow for a 24-hour cure period from applications so that we will no longer be kicking out um, SIDLAC applications for excellent projects for simplistic mistakes in their application. Um, so they now have 24-hour secure issues that have to do with just forgetting to add the correct documents or something like that. Um, we've also worked very closely between TCAC and SIDLAC to conform all of our regulatory references with, within our um, respective statutes. And um, we have modified the TEPR requirements so that we can speed production. So those are basically the things that we've been up to over the past uh, 10 months, less than a year. Um, we've been working hard on updating the regulations. And as you can see, uh, we're already in conformity with what Trailer Bill AB83 is asking us to do. So we'll just be working over the summer on uh, continuing to do what we've been doing and to do it a little bit better. So thank you very much for giving me the time. I hate to be the one standing in, in uh, standing in the way of people having their lunch. Can we open it up in case any board members have any questions for Judith? At least it's not drinks. Any comments for board members? Questions for Judith? Can he hear me? Yeah, we do. I'm looking to you. No one's, no one's raising their hand, so I think we're okay. Oh, wonderful. Okay. So, that was so uh, thorough. Talk about the con construction cost study, and Mr. Um, Shoemaker mentioned this during the training that the construction cost of market rate and the construction cost of affordable there aren't really that many differences. Where we're seeing the increased cost is usually coming from the public benefit that gets added on to affordable housing, and. Um, one of the biggest cost drivers is the lack of rental or operating subsidies that goes into a project to keep it affordable and having to capitalize that operating cost. Mm -hmm. And then for affordable housing to have to go get five, six, seven, eight different resources to put together and the time 
that it takes to put that together are what are increasing some of the costs. But the construction cost of housing versus affordable housing versus market rate housing, we're really not seeing a whole lot of differences. Agreed, agreed, yes. And I, I do want to give a shout out to HCD, mm -hmm. my colleagues at HCD, and the, my colleagues at TCAP. When working on the disaster credits, we had resources from Community Development Block Grant Disaster Relief, CDBGR, and because the processes and the timing weren't quite aligned in how we deliver those funds, they worked together collaboratively to ensure that folks who were going to receive via a formula community development uh, block grant um, disaster relief funds were able to align those with disaster credits. So secretary, I want to thank you for your leadership on that because she has come in and she has already hit the ground running. Her and Gustavo working very collaboratively with TCAC. So some of the things that board members and stakeholders have told us we're already seeing those things being put into place. So thank you, Ms. Blackwell. Well, thank you, thank you. I'll turn it back over to you, Mr. Gunning. <laughs> well, that was certainly robust. Thank, thanks to both of you and thanks for the effort. Um, I guess, are we gonna hear from Tim now? Or is any, let me see if any other questions from board members on that presentation. Great, so let's move on, you know, it certainly is neat, and Jonathan, I'm singling you out here too. Um, we saw this program start, keep your home, and now we get to see it end. I don't know what that means. We just been here long, or we did a good job. I'm choosing to think it's the good job portion. But Tim, let's wrap up. Keep your home, California. Uh, sure. Can you guys hear me? Yeah. Just turn up the volume a little bit. Okay. Can you guys hear me? Now it's good. Okay. Now it's good. Okay. Um, so, I'm here today as part of the leadership team for CalMac, which is um, California Mortgage Assistance Corporation. CalMac administers Keep Your Home California. Um, as Tia mentioned earlier, uh, we stopped taking applications into Keep Your Home California about two years ago. And back in May of this year, we actually finally closed the program. Uh, we had our final uh, funding in the program in the first quarter this year and in may we closed the program um, on this slide here what you're seeing is that this is the final tally of the program um, we helped um, 79,803 unique borrowers and because some of these borrowers actually avail themselves to multiple um, programs that we had we actually approved 93,730 applications across different programs. And um, as Tia mentioned earlier, we dispersed or we funded $2.2 billion of program proceeds. And of that $2.2 billion, $150 million came from recycling of um, liens that were placed on um, the assistance. And it is true that I think that one way to measure success is that by the number of people we helped, and it's wonderful that we were able to help more than 79,000 homeowners. But another way, um, and this is on slide three here, another way we measure success is that we look at outcome. So what we're trying to do here, and this is a measurement that um, US Treasury uh, created to measure success of the programs. What we're doing here is that we're tracking um, what happens to the homeowner? Uh, what happened to the homeowner 24 months after the assistance is given? So what you see here is that about 5,400 homeowners uh, did a traditional sale of their homes, and we consider that to be a success as well. And then about 63,000 homeowners are actually still in their homes. So that gives us a, what we call a retention percentage of 97.85 percent. So what that means is that. With, within 24 months of the program assistance, more than 97% of their, uh, 97% 90, of the homeowners had an outcome that we consider to be positive, either a sale or they're still in their homes. And you'll notice that uh, this 68,000 number is a little bit different from the number I showed in the previous slide of 79,000, because that means that that difference of roughly 10,000 
are people who receive assistance uh, within the last 24 months. So we haven't been able to track their progress at the end of that 24 month period to see uh, how they contribute this percentage. Um, the last thing I would say, I'll keep it quick. I know that um, it's almost lunchtime, is that uh, we started this program just about this time, about 10 years ago. And we have had uh, three different executive office in that period. We have uh, three different, as it turns out, leadership team uh, for CalMAC and Keep Your Home over that period of time. Uh, we have had a lot of consultants who have helped us uh, make this program successful, partners and um, stakeholders. And, you know, I want, I'm not going to be here to name all of them, but, you know, er there's a lot of people who contributed to the success of this program. And, um, kudos to everyone who uh, were part of that effort. And we, um, and not the most important of which is that we also had um, a lot of board members who served on that board to help us um, guide that program and make it as successful as it is um, at the end of the program. And I'm, I'm sure some of you guys know that Tina and Delilah are actually board members on that um, board as well. And I think that um, they want to also um, Take this opportunity to say a couple of things about the program. Who's going first? Um, well, why don't I start? And Delilah, you could pick up afterwards. Um, first and foremost, I just wanted to uh, compliment the staff uh, who just simply worked diligently on on delivering this program. What you don't see here is all the, the back work, all the phone calls that were made to the various clients, many of which uh, were going through some of the most troubling times. Uh, not only were their homes at risk, but some would actually say that their entire lives were at risk. Um, since, as we all know, how important um, home ownership is to the long-term health and wellness of families, especially uh, those that are uh, in uh, underserved or representative of underserved uh, and minority communities. Um, so that's what it doesn't show here. It doesn't show all the audits work that is involved here as well. There's a lot of oversight in this program, um, which is not reflected here, but lots and lots of time uh, spent there. Um, that is not reflective here, but it was there. And, it, and, and and I, I applaud the, the team. Um, before Tim, we, we actually had a, other folks who are no longer with us anymore who have come and gone, who participated in this program. It doesn't reflect their work either, but it was done and it was there. Uh, and then finally, um, I want to just share that without this program, um, we're talking, you know, what, you're, what we're talking about is equitable distribution of funding. Um, and this is a program that is sincerely reflected of that, both in geography as well as the demographics. And um, Riverside and San Bernardino that I represent was well represented uh, in the deliverable in delivery of this program, which I sincerely, sincerely appreciate. So um, I'll leave it there um, and, and, and just wrap up with one last sentence uh, about Tim. Um, Tim has taken on this role. He's taken on, I don't know how many jobs Tim has, but. Um, <laughs> it's like a Jamaican. Four. Four, okay. But he has managed this with um, uh, the, the same level of intensity that he did when he was managing um, the state agency's rating and um, he's come through again and again. So thank you, Tim, very specifically uh, of, with your contribution in ensuring that this program was an absolute success. Uh, this is Jonathan. I, I, I'd like to add just a couple comments. First of all, Tim, I, I don't know why you gave up sports metaphors, but he's the classic utility player. Um, but then <laughs> just uh, a comment about the role of the board. You know, when this when this program first started, it was a time of extraordinary crisis. And the role of the board, I, I sometimes thought we should have gotten combat pay because we, we basically had to sit quietly 
and listen to hour after hour of human anguish and and not be able to respond other than to say the board's working or the staff is working on this um and so yes the staff did put in a lot of hours and worked really hard but it also was really important for the board to sit there in public and give people the due of listening to their stories of pain and struggle. That was just a really critical uh, part of the function of this board. I hope we don't have to get there again, but the way things are going, we may have a lot of people facing eviction and maybe a different board will deal with that. But let's not forget that sometimes the most important role of this board is to listen to the public. Jonathan. Jonathan. Absolutely, and and I just wanted to to echo both Tina and Tim's um, you know summary of of the of the success and and I wish we had that slide up again, but yeah, you know that's sixty sixty three thousand people that families and households and lives that were impacted by this program. You know, uh, five more than five thousand were able to successfully sell their home. Uh, without going into foreclosure or deed in lieu. It is it is huge how um, not only did we impact the their ability to stay in their neighborhoods and keep the fabric of community alive, but you know, we we avoided homelessness for some of these or we avoided overcrowding uh, situations in some of these. And it was with the tenacity of Tim and the team and everybody that came before Tim um, that really helped do these workouts. You know, and it is not lost on us that while we had uh, a primary, uh, you know, direct assistance of, of 79,000 people, multiple uh, loans and products were provided to, you know, to about 20,000 of them, right? They needed more products and they needed more help. And that speaks to the wraparound services that we were able to provide through the program and through... Um, just the the human contact uh, that we had with folks. So two billion dollars, uh, and 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 the two things that I would just point out to to the board is that the partnerships that we forged with our fellow um, state agencies uh, are not evident here. But we we worked with EDD to send out notices about the program. We engaged EDD and other state agencies to really uh, outreach to folks that were being impacted and that they were them, they themselves were helping. So it was a real collaborative effort between the state agencies in terms of how we work together. And with the co, you know, with the crisis that we're facing with COVID, I think that, you know, we could dupl duplicate and replicate a lot of these same relationships uh, moving forward. So I urge the, the, the teams to, you know, take a look at the best practices uh, of the KYHC program and see what we can implement now with COVID. Um, and then the last thing I would say is that uh, we don't have the percentage of administrative uh, funds here that we used, but Tia and the team uh, administered this program for, I, I think, less than 10% of, of the total contract. So it was a, you know, it was a Herculean effort to really administer this and, and make as many funds available to the end user um, as we as we did. So I'm getting off my little, uh, you know, my little <laughs> preacher, no, stay, preacher stay box. But yay! Yeah, I know. Stay on that soapbox because I'd like to just wrap <laughs> up because the the program was a national model, and as Tim and Tia know, the federal government recognized California as someone who was doing this very successfully. And we beat all the other states. And Jonathan, I know you remember that meeting at the Holiday Inn where every the protesters. My first board meeting. My meeting. Yeah, well, we just had to sit there. And I, I've seen her on the golf course, but I got to give a shout out to Di Richardson because I, I gave more grief to Di over this program and why it wasn't successful. And so the changes, particularly the media and advertising the program um, that everyone got access to, it was important. So just kudos, Tina, Delilah, Jonathan, and Tia, and the whole crew. Um, great, great, great job on, on Keep Your Home. Anyone, any other board members want to pile on on that? All right. 
Um, I know item number 10, I think Tia covered in her initial comments, but Tia, is there anything else you want to add before I ask for comments from the public? No, but I do want to give another shout out to Di Richardson. I'm glad you did that, but I really did want to do that. Her, Jean Mills, and the whole Keep Your Home California team were top notch. They were actually recognized nationally at the standards they brought to that. So I do want to give a shout out to Di Richardson. We did cover the update to uh, 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 the bond recycling in my executive director reports. So for the sake of time, um, if you want to go straight to public comment so that we can, and there are reports. Um, if any board members have questions about the reports, we can answer that, but I'll turn it over back to you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Tia. Um, at this time, Courtney, any uh, comments from the public or anyone from the public want to comment? Uh, we do not have anyone from the public with a comment. You're, you awesome. can proceed. Seeing that, uh, turn to the board. Any final comments from the board? How about a motion to adjourn? Mr. Russell, move. Is there a second? Jonathan? Second. Everyone second. I second. <laughs> All right. Everybody, thank you. Be safe. It's still out there. Don't, don't get in trouble. We'll see everyone next time. Thank you all. Thank you. And thank you for your support. Thank you. Thank you.